programs and policy today. Lawmakers will turn to a judicial nomination at 5 p.m. Eastern, and they'll vote on that after about half an hour of debate. And now, li and now live to the U.S. Senate floor here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Mighty God, as we convene the Senate today after a time of thanksgiving, please give every member of this body a desire to bring great honor to you. As significant issues are discussed in this chamber, let there be cordiality and civility, wisdom and courage, humility and faith. Lord, make our nation a shining example of positive compromise and constructive cooperation. Bring to each one serving on Capitol Hill the wisdom to see what can be done for the good of our nation and world when your ways become our ways. We pray in your great name. Amen. Please join me in reciting a Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., November 28, 2011, to the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Jim Webb, a Senator from the Commonwealth of Virginia, to perform the duties of the Chair. Signed, Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Majority Leader. Note, note the absent quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
I should have Mr. Kent to call the Corn Beach Terminate to I say to the two managers of the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Pardon me? Without objection, oh, so ordered. I'm sorry, Mr. President. Um, I say to the two managers of the defense bill who are on the floor today. The Republican leader is going to hear, uh, be here in a few minutes to give a speech. I'm going to give one, but it shouldn't take long, so and then you can get to the we'll move immediately to the bill. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Uh, Mr. President. Mr. Leader. Following leader remarks, the Senate will resume consideration of 1867, the Defense Authorization Bill. At 5 p.m., the Senate will be in executive session to consider the nomination of Christopher Droney to be United States Circuit Judge for the Second Circuit. At 5.30, there will be a vote on that nomination. Mr. President, I trust that you and all of our staff and everyone in this great capital complex have had a safe and happy holiday. Hope everyone is well rested because we have a difficult work period ahead of us. We have much to do over the next few weeks, and Hanukkah and Christmas holiday are quickly looming ahead. This week we need to finish the work on the defense authorization bill and even more. This month we'll also handle a number of nominations that extend unemployment insurance for Americans still struggling to find work during these difficult times. And we have more appropriations work to do. The continuing resolution to fund the government expires on December 16th. And we must not neglect the responsibility to continue our work to put Americans back to work. So we'll take up additional pieces of President Obama's American Jobs Act. This week, we'll introduce legislation that would give the economy a boost by putting money back in the pockets of middle class workers and small businesses by extending and expanding a popular payroll tax cut. More than 120 million families took home an extra $120 billion this year, Mr. President, thanks to this payroll tax cut that we championed. The average family held on to more than $935 of their hard earned dollars this year. We need to assure those families that they can rely on that tax cut next year as well. But this legislation does, not, does more than just protect the tax cuts Americans already count on. It deepens and expands that tax relief as well. Next year, 120 million American families will keep an average of $1,500 because of this legislation. That means they'll have more money to spend on necessities like gas and food and will buy things that help spur economic growth in their communities. Businesses will also benefit from this tax cut. 98% of American firms will see their payroll taxes cut in half on their first $5 million of wages that they pay out. In Nevada, 50,000 businesses will benefit from this tax cut, and many businesses will save tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this legislation will help families and businesses while spurring hiring and giving the economy a boost. And it will be fully paid for with a small 3.25% surtax on income over a million dollars. So a person who makes a million dollars a year, they won't pay an extra penny. Someone who makes $1.1 million, that is an extra $100,000, will pay $3,250, more than they would have originally. At a time when many working families are still struggling, we can't afford not to extend and expand this important payroll tax cut. So I was disappointed to hear from some of my Republican colleagues, specifically the junior senator from Arizona, who has already come out in opposition to this tax cut. I think it's fair to say that all Republicans have not, but my friend from Arizona did. Mr. President, this is wrong. Those who loudly claim to care about keeping taxes low, but too often it seems they only care about keeping taxes low for the richest of the rich. The same Republicans who today oppose a payroll tax cut for hundreds of millions of businesses and families last week jettisoned the hopes of a large-scale deficit reduction deal from the Super Committee because they insist on a massive permanent tax giveaways for the very rich. Cutting taxes for middle-class families and businesses should be an area where Republicans and Democrats can find common ground, as we have in the past. Opposition by Republicans smacks of partisanship, because this tax cut has President Obama's fingerprints on it. It was his idea. Republicans won't support it, even though they know it's good policy for American families and businesses. 
Let's hope that they, that is not the case for all my friends. Let's examine the effects of their purely political opposition to a common sense tax cut. If Republicans block passage of this legislation, they will be taking money out of the pockets of American families. That is clear. A family making $50,000 a year, this proposal that we've talked about would not only preserve an existing $935 tax break, it would put an additional $565 a year in the family coffers. If Republicans get their way, that family will actually see its tax increase by about $1,000. If Republicans block this legislation, 120 American families and 98% of American businesses will not get a tax cut next year. Instead, 120 million families and millions of businesses will be hit with a tax increase. Those numbers are startling, they're shocking, but the potential impact on the large economy is downright scary. Economist Mark Zandi of Moody said the economy will likely plunge back into a full-blown recession racing the economic progress we've made if we don't extend this tax cut. It's clear neither our fragile middle class nor our fragile economic recovery can afford the kind of setback a failure to extend and expand these tax cuts would bring. Republicans say we can't afford to raise these taxes. If they choose to oppose this payroll tax cut, we'll know what they meant to say was we can't afford to raise taxes on the rich. In fact, more clearly, we cannot afford to raise taxes on the rich, but we're happy to raise taxes on the middle class. Mr. President, would you announce the business of the day? Under the previous order? I'm, I'm, we're going to go ahead and get my closure petition filed, okay? Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of S-1867, which the clerk will report. Calendar number 230, S-1867, a bill to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2012 for military activities of the Department of Defense for military construction and so forth and for other purposes. At the desk, Mr. President. Clerk will report the cloture motion. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on S-1867, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012, signed by 17 senators as follows. Reed of Nevada. I, don't, I ask unanimous consent that reading the names be waived. With the objections ordered. No, with the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
Tuesday, and I was consent to call the quorum be terminated. What, the, without objection, sir. Mr. President, uh, I ask unanimous consent that the Republican leader be recognized to offer his uh, statement as a leader's time until there be no parliamentary um, efforts on his behalf at this time. And when he finishes the leader's statement, then I will have the floor. Without objection, sir. Mr. President. Republican Leader. Are we on quorum call? We are not. <clears throat> well, first off, I'd like to welcome everybody back. I hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving. Shortly before we all left last week, we got some disappointing news when the Joint Committee on Deficit Reduction announced it was unable to reach the kind of bipartisan agreement that many of us had been hoping for. As I said then, this was a major disappointment uh, to those of us who'd hoped that the Joint Committee would ultimately agree to the kind of serious entitlement reforms and job-creating tax reforms that all of us know would have been a big, big help in getting our fiscal house in order and jolting this economy back to life. Such an agreement would have also sent a clear message to the American people and to the world that despite our many differences, lawmakers here are capable of coming together and making the kinds of very tough decisions about our nature's economic future that continue to elude lawmakers in Europe. I know for a fact that Republicans wanted this committee to deliver, and the good news is we'll still see $1.2 trillion in deficit reduction. But frankly, it's hard to escape the conclusion that some in the White House and even some Democrats here in the Senate were rooting for failure and doing what they could do to ensure that that failure occurred. I mean, what else are we supposed to think when the Democrats' top political strategist here in the Senate goes out on national television and predicts failure two weeks ahead of the deadline and then comes right out and says yesterday that he thinks the outcome he predicted is good politically for the president? This stuff isn't rocket science, but it's a big mistake. <clears throat> it might seem like a good political strategy to some, but it's bad for the country. And that's why I'm continuing my call today for the Democrats to control the Senate to work with us on jobs legislation that can actually uh, pass here in the Senate. that can get us beyond the permanent campaign by actually getting something done by working together. For the past several weeks, I've implored the Democratic majority here in the Senate to work with us on a number of job-creating bills that have already attracted strong bipartisan support over in the House. It seems to me that if the two parties share control of power in Washington, we should spend our time and our energies identifying job-creating measures the two parties do agree on and make them law. <clears throat> it's no secret that many people at the White House and a number of Democrats here in the Senate would still rather spend their time designing legislation to fail in the hopes of trying to frame up next year's election. But with all due respect to the political strategists over at the White House, I think most Americans would rather we took an entirely different approach. And that's why I think we should put aside the massive stimulus bill along with the permanent tax hikes that Democrats are calling for in order to pay for it. In fact, I think it's safe to say that any attempt to pass another temporary stimulus funded by a permanent tax hike on the very people we're counting on to create the private sector jobs we need in this country is purely political and not intended to do a thing to help the economy since we already know it's likely uh, to fail with bipartisan opposition. So let's focus instead on the kind of targeted bipartisan bills that the President quietly agreed to last month, the 3% withholding bill championed by Senator Brown and the Veterans Hiring Bill. As I pointed out again and again, the House has been busy all year passing bipartisan jobs bills just like these that we could rally around in a sign of unity and common concern for the millions of Americans who are looking for jobs. There's no reason we shouldn't focus on passing these bills rather than using the Senate floor as a stage for symbolic show votes that we know won't lead to anything except more tension and political acrimony. We should do what we were sent here to do, and that means more bill signings and fewer bus tours. <clears throat> At the moment, the Senate business is the defense authorization bill, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We've got a lot of amendments pending on this important legislation, 
members of both sides would like to see these amendments taken up and voted on. So let's stay on this legislation and focus on doing it right. Let's show that we can actually legislate around here. Once we're finished, I'm hoping we'll be able to find a bipartisan path to resolve the other issues before us before the end of the year. Americans are growing tired of the same old political shouting matches and political brinksmanship that's marked this Democratic-led Senate over the past few years. They're tired of careening from one crisis to another, holding their breath in the hopes that the two parties will put their differences aside and work something out at the 11th hour, only to be disappointed when Democrats decide they'd prefer to have a political issue to run on rather than solutions to vote on. <clears throat> at last count, the House Republicans had passed 22 jobs bills that were designed not only to incentivize the private sector to create jobs, but which were also designed to attract strong bipartisan support. In other words, they've been designing legislation to actually pass. They've been legislating with an eye toward making a difference instead of simply making a point. What I'm saying is let's follow their lead. Let's come together and pass more bipartisan jobs bills and show the American people that we're not going to settle for the easy way out. The economic crisis we face is much too serious for more of the same. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Majority Leader. I ask that we now proceed to the DOD authorization bill, but it be for debate only until 5 p.m. today. Without objection, sir. Court report. It is a pending question.
Mr. President. Senator from Michigan. Mr. 